Chapter 3 The Germans and the dog were engaged in a military operation which had an amusingly self-explanatory name, a human enterprise which is seldom described in detail, whose name alone, when reported as news or history, gives many war enthusiasts a sort of post-coital satisfaction. It is, in the imagination of combat's fans, the divinely listless love play that follows the orgasm of victory. It is called mopping up. The dog, who had sounded so ferocious in the winter distances, was a female German shepherd. She was shivering. Her tail was between her legs. She had been borrowed that morning from a farmer. She had never been to war before. She had no idea what game was being played. Her name was Princess. Two of the Germans were boys in their early teens. Two were ramshackle old men, droolers as toothless as carp. They were irregulars, armed and clothed fragmentarily with junk taken from real soldiers who were newly dead. So it goes. They were farmers from just across the German border, not far away. Their commander was a middle-aged corporal, red-eyed, scrawny, tough as dried beef, sick of war. He had been wounded four times, and patched up, and sent back to war. He was a very good soldier, about to quit, about to find somebody to surrender to. His bandy legs were thrust into golden cavalry boots which he had taken from a dead Hungarian colonel in the Russian front. So it goes. Those boots were almost all he owned in this world. They were his home. An anecdote. One time, a recruit was watching him bone and wax those golden boots, and he held one up to the recruit and said, If you look in there deeply enough, you'll see Adam and Eve. Billy Pilgrim had not heard this anecdote, but, lying on the black ice there, Billy stared into the patina of the corporal's boots, saw Adam and Eve in the golden depths. They were naked. They were so innocent, so vulnerable, so eager to behave decently. Billy Pilgrim loved them. Next to the golden boots were a pair of feet, which were swaddled in rags. They were crisscrossed by canvas straps, were shod with hinged wooden clogs. Billy looked up at the face that went with the clogs. It was the face of a blonde angel, of a fifteen-year-old boy. The boy was as beautiful as Eve. Billy was helped to his feet by the lovely boy, by the heavenly androgyne, and the others came forward to dust the snow off Billy, and then they searched him for weapons. He didn't have any. The most dangerous thing they found on his person was a two-inch pencil stub. Three inoffensive bangs came from far away. They came from German rifles. The two scouts who had ditched Billy and Weary had just been shot. They had been lying in ambush for Germans. They had been discovered and shot from behind. Now they were dying in the snow, feeling nothing, turning the snow to the color of raspberry sherbet. So it goes. So Roland Weary was the last of the three musketeers. And Weary, bug-eyed with terror, was being disarmed. The corporal gave Weary's pistol to the pretty boy. He marveled at Weary's cruel trench knife, said in German that Weary would no doubt like to use the knife on him, to tear his face off with the spiked knuckles, to stick the blade into his belly or throat. He spoke no English, and Billy and Weary understood no German. Nice playthings you have, the corporal told Weary, and he handed the knife to an old man. Isn't that a pretty thing, hmm? He tore open Weary's overcoat and blouse. Brass buttons flew like popcorn. The corporal reached into Weary's gaping bosom as though he meant to tear out his pounding heart, but he brought out only Weary's bulletproof Bible instead. A bulletproof Bible is a Bible small enough to be slipped into a soldier's breast pocket over his heart. It is sheathed in steel. The corporal found the dirty picture of the woman and the pony in Weary's hip pocket. What a lucky pony, eh? he said. Hmm? Hmm? Don't you wish you were that pony? He handed the picture to the other old man. Spoils of war! It's yours, all yours, you lucky lad! Then he made Weary sit down in the snow and take off his combat boots, which he gave to the beautiful boy. He gave Weary the boy's clogs. So Weary and Billy were both without decent military footwear now, and they had to walk for miles and miles with Weary's clogs clacking, with Billy bobbing up and down, up and down, crashing into Weary from time to time. 
Excuse me, Billy would say, or I beg your pardon. They were brought at last to a stone cottage at a fork in the road. It was a collecting point for prisoners of war. Billy and Weary were taken inside, where it was warm and smoky. There was a fire sizzling and popping in the fireplace. The fuel was furniture. There were about twenty other Americans in there, sitting on the floor with their backs to the wall, staring into the flames, thinking whatever there was to think, which was zero. Nobody talked. Nobody had any good war stories to tell. Billy and Weary found places for themselves, and Billy went to sleep with his head on the shoulder of an unprotesting captain. The captain was a chaplain. He was a rabbi. He had been shot through the hand. Billy traveled in time, opened his eyes, found himself staring into the glass eyes of a jade-green mechanical owl. The owl was hanging upside down from a rod of stainless steel. The owl was Billy's optometer in his office in Ilium. An optometer is an instrument for measuring refractive errors in eyes, in order that corrective lenses may be prescribed. Billy had fallen asleep while examining a female patient who was in a chair on the other side of the owl. He had fallen asleep at work before. It had been funny at first. Now Billy was starting to get worried about it, about his mind in general. He tried to remember how old he was. Couldn't. He tried to remember what year it was. He couldn't remember that either. Doctor, said the patient tentatively. Hmm, he said. You're so quiet. Sorry. You were talking away there, and then you got so quiet. Um, you see something terrible? Terrible? Some disease in my eyes. No, no, said Billy, wanting to doze again. Your eyes are fine. You just need glasses for reading. He told her to go across the corridor to see the wide selection of frames there. When she was gone, Billy opened the drapes and was no wiser as to what was outside. The view was still blocked by a Venetian blind, which he hoisted clatteringly. Bright sunlight came crashing in. There were thousands of parked automobiles down there, twinkling on a vast lake of blacktop. Billy's office was part of a suburban shopping center. Right outside the window was Billy's own Cadillac Eldorado Coupe de Ville. He read the stickers on the bumper. Visit Osable Chasm, said one. Support your local police department, said another. There was a third. Impeach Earl Warren, it said. The stickers about the police and Earl Warren were gifts from Billy's father-in-law, a member of the John Birch Society. The date on the license plate was 1967, which would make Billy Pilgrim 44 years old. He asked himself this. Where have all the years gone? Billy turned his attention to his desk. There was an open copy of The Review of Optometry there. It was opened to an editorial, which Billy now read, his lips moving slightly. What happens in 1968 will rule the fate of European optometrists for at least 50 years, Billy read. With this warning, Jean Thiriart, secretary of the National Union of Belgium Opticians, is pressing for formation of a European optometry society. The alternatives, he says, will be the obtaining of a professional status or, by 1971, reduction to the role of spectacle sellers. Billy tried hard to care. A siren went off, scared the hell out of him. He was expecting World War III at any time. The siren was simply announcing high noon. It was housed in a cupola shop, atop a firehouse across the street from Billy's office. Billy closed his eyes. When he opened them, he was back in World War II again. His head was on the wounded rabbi's shoulder. A German was kicking his feet, telling him to wake up, that it was time to move on. The Americans, with Billy among them, formed a fool's parade on the road outside. There was a photographer present, a German war correspondent with a Lika. He took pictures of Billy's and Roland Weary's feet. The picture was widely published two days later as heartening evidence of how miserably equipped the American army often was, despite its reputation for being rich. The photographer wanted something more lively, though, a picture of an actual capture. So the guards staged one for him. They threw Billy into shrubbery. When Billy came out of the shrubbery, his face wreathed in goofy goodwill. They menaced him with their machine pistols, as though they were capturing him then. 
Billy's smile as he came out of the shrubbery was at least as peculiar as Mona Lisa's, for he was simultaneously on foot in Germany in 1944 and riding his Cadillac in 1967. Germany dropped away, and 1967 became bright and clear, free of interference from any other time. Billy was on his way to a Lions Club luncheon meeting. It was a hot August, but Billy's car was air-conditioned. He stopped by a signal in the middle of Ilium's black ghetto. The people who lived here hated it so much that they had burned down a lot of it a month before. It was all they had, and they'd wrecked it. The neighborhood reminded Billy of some of the towns he had seen in the war. The curbs and sidewalks were crushed in many places, showing where the National Guard tanks and half-tracks had been. Blood Brother, said a message written in pink paint on the side of a shattered grocery store. There was a tap on Billy's car window. A black man was out there. He wanted to talk about something. The light had changed. Billy did the simplest thing. He drove on. Billy drove through a scene of even greater desolation. It looked like Dresden after it was firebombed, like the surface of the moon. The house where Billy had grown up used to be somewhere in what was so empty now. This was urban renewal. A new Ilium government center and a pavilion of the arts and a peace lagoon and high-rise apartment buildings were going up here soon. That was all right with Billy Pilgrim. The speaker at the Lions Club meeting was a major in the Marines. He said that Americans had no choice but to keep fighting in Vietnam until they achieved victory, or until communists realized that they could not force their way of life on weak countries. The major had been there on two separate tours of duty. He told of many terrible and many wonderful things he had seen. He was in favor of increased bombings, of bombing North Vietnam back into the Stone Age if it refused to see reason. Billy was not moved to protest the bombing of North Vietnam, did not shudder about the hideous things he himself had seen bombing do. He was simply having lunch with the Lions Club, of which he was past president now. Billy had a framed prayer on his office wall which expressed his method for keeping going, even though he was unenthusiastic about living. A lot of patients who saw the prayer on Billy's wall told him that it helped them to keep going, too. It went like this. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Now he was being introduced to the Marine Major. The person who was performing the introduction was telling the Major that Billy was a veteran and that Billy had a son who was a sergeant in the Green Berets in Vietnam. The Major told Billy that the Green Berets were doing a great job and that he should be proud of his son. I am. I certainly am, said Billy Pilgrim. He went home for a nap after lunch. He was under doctor's orders to take a nap every day. The doctor hoped that this would relieve a complaint that Billy had. Every so often, for no apparent reason, Billy Pilgrim would find himself weeping. Nobody had ever caught Billy doing it. Only the doctor knew. It was an extremely quiet thing Billy did, and not very moist. Billy owned a lovely Georgian home in Ilium. He was as rich as Croesus, something he had never expected to be, not in a million years. He had five other optometrists working for him in the shopping plaza location, and netted over $60,000 a year. In addition, he owned a fifth of the new Holiday Inn out on Route 54, and half of three Tasty Freeze stands. Tasty Freeze was a sort of frozen custard. It gave all the pleasure that ice cream could give without the stiffness and bitter coldness of ice cream. Billy's home was empty. His daughter Barbara was about to get married, and she and his wife had gone downtown to pick out patterns for her crystal and silverware. There was a note saying so on the kitchen table. There were no servants. People just weren't interested in careers in domestic service anymore. There wasn't a dog, either. There used to be a dog named Spot, but he died. So it goes. Billy had liked Spot a lot, and Spot had liked him. Billy went up the carpeted stairway and into his and his wife's bedroom. The room had flowered wallpaper. There was a double bed with a clock radio on the table beside it. 
Also on the table were controls for the electric blanket, and a switch to turn on a gentle vibrator which was bolted to the springs of the box mattress. The trade name of the vibrator was Magic Fingers. The vibrator was the doctor's idea, too. Billy took off his trifocals and his coat and his necktie and his shoes, and he closed the Venetian blinds and then the drapes, and he lay down on the outside of the coverlet. But sleep would not come. Tears came instead. They seeped. Billy turned on the magic fingers, and he was jiggled as he wept. The door chimes rang. Billy got off the bed and looked down through a window at the front doorstep to see if somebody important had come to call. There was a crippled man down there, as spastic in space as Billy Pilgrim was in time. Convulsions made the man dance flappingly all the time, made him change his expressions, too, as though he were trying to imitate various famous movie stars. Another cripple was ringing a doorbell across the street. He was on crutches. He had only one leg. He was so jammed between his crutches that his shoulders hid his ears. Billy knew what the cripples were up to. They were selling subscriptions to magazines that would never come. People subscribed to them because the salesmen were so pitiful. Billy had heard about this racket from a speaker at the Lions Club two weeks before, a man from the Better Business Bureau. The man said that anybody who saw cripples working a neighborhood for magazine subscriptions should call the police. Billy looked down the street, saw a new Buick Riviera parked about half a block away. There was a man in it, and Billy assumed correctly that he was the man who had hired the cripples to do this thing. Billy went on weeping as he contemplated the cripples and their boss. His door chimes clanged hellishly. He closed his eyes and opened them again. He was still weeping, but he was back in Luxembourg again. He was marching with a lot of other prisoners. It was a winter wind that was bringing tears to his eyes. Ever since Billy had been thrown into shrubbery for the sake of a picture, he had been seeing St. Elmo's fire, a sort of electronic radiance around the heads of his companions and captors. It was in treetops and on rooftops of Luxembourg, too. It was beautiful. Billy was marching with his hands on top of his head, and so were all the other Americans. Billy was bobbing up and down, up and down. Now he crashed into Roland Weary accidentally. I beg your pardon, he said. Weary's eyes were tearful also. Weary was crying because of horrible pains in his feet. The hinged clogs were transforming his feet into blood puddings. At each road intersection, Billy's group was joined by more Americans with their hands on top of their haloed heads. Billy had smiles for them all. They were moving like water, downhill all the time, and they flowed at last to a main highway on a valley's floor. Through the valley flowed a Mississippi of humiliated Americans. Tens of thousands of Americans shuffled eastward, their hands clasped on top of their heads. They sighed and groaned. Billy and his group joined the river of humiliation, and the late afternoon sun came out from the clouds. The Americans didn't have the road to themselves. The westbound lane boiled and boomed with vehicles which were rushing German reserves to the front. The reserves were violent, wind-burned, bristly men. They had teeth like piano keys. They were festooned with machine-gun belts, smoked cigars, and guzzled booze. They took wolfish bites from sausages, patted their horny palms with potato masher grenades. One soldier in black was having a drunk hero's picnic all by himself on top of a tank. He spit on the Americans. The spit hit Roland Weary's shoulder, gave Weary a fourragere of snot and bloodwurst and tobacco juice and schnapps. Billy found the afternoon stingingly exciting. There was so much to see. Dragon's teeth, killing machines, corpses with bare feet that were blue and ivory. So it goes. Bobbing up and down, up and down, Billy beamed lovingly at a bright lavender farmhouse that had been spattered with machine gun bullets. Standing in its cockeyed doorway was a German colonel. With him was his unpainted whore. Billy crashed into Weary's shoulder, and Weary cried out sobbingly, Walk right! Walk right! They were climbing a gentle rise now. When they reached the top, they weren't in Luxembourg anymore. They were in Germany. A motion picture camera was set up at the border to record the fabulous victory. 
Two civilians in bearskin coats were leaning on the camera when Billy and Weary came by. They had run out of film hours ago. One of them singled out Billy's face for a moment, then focused at Infinity again. There was a tiny plume of smoke at Infinity. There was a battle there. People were dying there. So it goes. And the sun went down, and Billy found himself bobbing in place in a railroad yard. There were rows and rows of boxcars waiting. They had brought reserves to the front. Now they were going to take prisoners into Germany's interior. Flashlight beams danced crazily. The Germans sorted out the prisoners according to rank. They put sergeants with sergeants, majors with majors, and so on. A squad of full colonels was halted near Billy. One of them had double pneumonia. He had a high fever and vertigo. As the railroad yard dipped and swooned around the colonel, he tried to hold himself steady by staring into Billy's eyes. The colonel coughed and coughed, and then he said to Billy, You one of my boys? This was a man who had lost an entire regiment, about 4,500 men, a lot of them children, actually. Billy didn't reply. The question made no sense. What was your outfit? said the colonel. He coughed and coughed. Every time he inhaled, his lungs rattled like greasy paper bags. Billy couldn't remember the outfit he was from. You from the 451st? 451st what? said Billy. There was a silence. Infantry regiment, said the colonel at last. Oh, said Billy Pilgrim. There was another long silence, with the colonel dying and dying, drowning where he stood. And then he cried out wetly, It's me, boys! It's Wild Bob! That is what he had always wanted his troops to call him, Wild Bob. None of the people who could hear him were actually from his regiment, except for Roland Weary, and Weary wasn't listening. All Weary could think of was the agony in his own feet. But the colonel imagined that he was addressing his beloved troops for the last time, and he told them that they had nothing to be ashamed of, that they were dead Germans all over the battlefield who wished to God they had never heard of the 451st. He said that after the war he was going to have a regimental reunion in his hometown, which was Cody, Wyoming. He was going to barbecue whole steers. He said all this while staring into Billy's eyes. He made the inside of poor Billy's skull echo with balderdash. God be with you, boys, he said, and that echoed and echoed. And then he said, if you're ever in Cody, Wyoming, just ask for Wild Bob. I was there. So was my old war buddy, Bernard V. O'Hare. Billy Pilgrim was packed into a boxcar with many other privates. He and Roland Weary were separated. Weary was packed into another car in the same train. There were narrow ventilators at the corners of the car, under the eaves. Billy stood by one of these, and, as the crowd pressed against him, he climbed partway up a diagonal corner brace to make more room. This placed his eyes on a level with the ventilator, so he could see another train about ten yards away. Germans were writing on the cards with blue chalk, the number of persons in each car, their rank, their nationality, the date on which they had been put aboard. Other Germans were securing the hasps on the car doors with wire and spikes and other trackside trash. Billy could hear somebody writing on his car, too, but he couldn't see who was doing it. Most of the privates on Billy's car were very young, at the end of childhood. But crammed into the corner with Billy was a former hobo who was forty years old. I've been hungrier than this, the hobo told Billy. I've been in worse places than this. This ain't so bad. A man in a boxcar across the way called out through the ventilator that a man had just died in there. So it goes. There were four guards who heard him. They weren't excited by the news. Yo, yo, said one, nodding dreamily. Yo, yo. And the guards didn't open the car with the dead man in it. They opened the next car instead, and Billy Pilgrim was enchanted by what was in there. It was like heaven. There was candlelight, and there were bunks with quilts and blankets heaped on them. There was a cannonball stove with a steaming coffee pot on top. There was a table with a bottle of wine and a loaf of bread and a sausage on it. There were four bowls of soup. 
There were pictures of castles and lakes and pretty girls on the walls. This was the rolling home of the railroad guards, men whose business it was to be forever guarding freight rolling from here to there. The four guards went inside and closed the door. A little while later, they came out smoking cigars, talking contentedly in the mellow lower register of the German language. One of them saw Billy's face at the ventilator. He wagged a finger at him in an affectionate warning, telling him to be a good boy. The Americans across the way told the guards again about the dead man on their car. The guards got a stretcher out of their own cozy car, opened the dead man's car, and went inside. The dead man's car wasn't crowded at all. There were just six live colonels in there, and one dead one. The Germans carried the corpse out. The corpse was Wild Bob. So it goes. During the night, some of the locomotives began to tootle to one another, and then to move. The locomotive and the last car of each train were marked with a striped banner of orange and black, indicating that the train was not fair game for airplanes, that it was carrying prisoners of war. The war was nearly over. The locomotives began to move east in late December. The war would end in May. German prisons everywhere were absolutely full, and there was no longer any food for the prisoners to eat, and no longer any fuel to keep them warm. And yet, here came more prisoners. Billy Pilgrim's train, the longest train of all, did not move for two days. This ain't bad, the hobo told Billy on the second day. This ain't nothing at all. Billy looked out through the ventilator. The railroad yard was a desert now, except for a hospital train marked with red crosses on a siding far, far away. Its locomotive whistled. The locomotive of Billy Pilgrim's train whistled back. They were saying, hello. Even though Billy's train wasn't moving, its boxcars were kept locked tight. Nobody was going to get off until the final destination. To the guards who walked up and down outside, each car became a single organism which ate and drank and excreted through its ventilators. It talked or sometimes yelled through its ventilators, too. In went water and loaves of black bread and sausage and cheese, and out came shit and piss and language. Human beings in there were excreting into steel helmets which were passed to the people in the ventilators who dumped them. Billy was a dumper. The human beings also passed canteens, which guards would fill with water. When food came in, the human beings were quiet and trusting and beautiful. They shared. Human beings in there took turns, standing or lying down. The legs of those who stood were like fence posts, driven into a warm, squirming, farting, sighing earth. The queer earth was a mosaic of sleepers who nestled like spoons. Now the train began to creep eastward. Somewhere in there was Christmas. Billy Pilgrim nestled like a spoon with the hobo on Christmas night, and he fell asleep, and he traveled in time to 1967 again, to the night he was kidnapped by a flying saucer from Tralfanador. <laughs>